Okay, let's get started. So thanks everybody for coming. Uh, this is the final policy and practice seminar of the term. Uh, we're delighted to have you here. The policy and practice series, for those who haven't come before, is hosted by the USCL Department of Political Science and School of Public Policy. My name is Jeff Howard. I'm an associate professor here in the School of Public Policy, and I'm really delighted to chair tonight's session, Governing Online Speech is the Online Safety Bill, the Answer. So open the newspaper just about every day, and there's some new story about what's happening with the large social media companies. So just this week, we've had reporting about Facebook's special treatment program for VIP accounts. Just today, we had reporting on a new study exposing the widespread availability of content promoting self-harm on TikTok. And there's a new chapter in the never-ending story of Elon Musk's takeover of Twitter seemingly every hour. So these stories are only the most recent examples in a steady stream of social media drama over the past few years, and that drama certainly hasn't escaped the attention of policymakers. We've seen that governments are increasingly concerned about speech uh, on the platform, such as hateful content and dangerous disinformation, and certainly one of the most complex and potentially transformative proposals to regulate social media and online, other online intermediaries is the UK's own online safety bill, and that's gonna be the subject of tonight's discussion. Now, this bill has recently been brought back to life with a series of amendments and is currently being re-scrutinized in the House of Commons. It will almost certainly be passed by the current government in the coming year, and it will grant the regulator Ofcom with substantial new powers over social media. Yet the bill, of course, is highly controversial, with many people think thinking that the bill goes too far in restricting free speech, and others thinking that it doesn't go far enough in preventing people from harms that speech might risk or cause. So we come together tonight to ask what to make of this bill and whether it strikes the right balance between respecting free speech on the one hand and preventing serious harm on the other. So to that end, I'm joined by the following panel of exceptionally well-qualified speakers to talk us through this issue. So Tony Stauer is an extremely experienced public servant and is currently the principal of online safety policy at Ofcom, and so he and his team will be personally involved in implementing the bill when the legislation is passed and is no doubt already preparing um, for that day. Maeve Walsh is here. She is a policy and government relations consultant with special expertise in digital and health policy. She's a former civil servant with 17 years experience in Whitehall. She's currently an associate associate with Carnegie UK. She's an advocate for legislation to prevent online harms and indeed has been part of a team uh, that crafted a highly influential set of proposals on how to regulate social media. Finally, we have Ruth Smith, the Baron Baroness Anderson of Snoke-on-Trent. She is a British Labour Party politician who was the MP for Stoke-on-Trent North from 2015 until 2019. Since 2022, she's been a member of the House of Lords. And in June 2020, she became chief executive of Index on Censorship an organization which campaigns for freedom of expression. Now, I'm gonna ask each speaker to offer five to 10 minutes of opening remarks, then we'll have a panel discussion for around 20 minutes, and finally, we'll open the floor to your questions and have a conversation with you about what you think about the online safety bill. Now, just a couple more preliminary comments before I hand it over to Tony Stauer to kick things off. The whole session, including the Q&A, is being recorded and is, is gonna be posted on the school's website, our YouTube channel, and our podcast after the event. If you speak by asking a question, you will be heard in the recording. If you don't speak, you won't be heard in the recording. We'll let you know when the recording is available, and we hope you will share it with others. OK, so we're going to start with Tony Stauer from Ofcom, who's going to offer us a bit more detail on the bill itself before moving to critical reflections from the rest of the panel. All right, take it away, Tony. Keep the file. Uh, here. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. I'm actually uh, perfectly okay with keeping the, uh, keeping the nice fireplace behind us. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. My name is Tony Stauer. Um, as Jeff said, I'm one of the uh, policy principals in the online safety policy team at Ofcom. Ofcom is the UK's broadcast regulator, so uh, we look after the communication services across the UK. That includes uh, broadcast, so we regulate um, the BBC and uh, other uh, TV stations. Uh, also, uh, all the mobile phone and spectrum allocation that goes along with that. The post service and, and parcels and a whole range of other issues as well that hopefully you don't have to come into contact with uh, very often. I'm going to talk a little bit now just about uh, 
uh, how Ofcom will be approaching the online safety bill, what the online safety bill actually requires of services, um, and a little bit about timings, although I suspect as this slide on timings was produced some weeks ago, it's probably a bit out of date by now. Let's, uh, let's uh, crack on by just talking a little bit about scope. So Jeff talked a bit about social media. Um, there's actually a, a, a really detailed uh, discussion about uh, uh, to be had about w what is in scope and out of scope. Broadly, the bill covers user-to-user -user and search services that are available in the United Kingdom. So user-to-user -user means any service that allows users to interact, to post content. Do you know, I, I might actually just move slightly out of the way to make sure that people can see. Um, uh, any uh, any uh, content videos, uh, user comments, or anything like that, oh, that all counts as user to user, and search services as well. So that counts as not just the uh, the broad search services like Bing, Google, and, and Yahoo, but also vertical search services within uh, uh, within a service itself. That will be caught by by relevant provisions there. So we're talking here about. Um, about those services, they, some of them will be categorised. Uh, that essentially means those services that have the broadest reach and have the broadest risk of content on their service, <coughs> they will be subject to some extra requirements as well. And right down at the bottom, there's some uh, uh, there's some extra requirements or additional requirements, I should say, on uh, certain types of pornography providers. So, porn providers where uh, without to go into too much detail, uh, where services upload their own content and to their own website and don't have user-to-user -user interaction, they will have to put in place um, special measures to stop children from accessing that. Moving quickly on then, the, the, the first duty that, uh, that all of these services will have to do is to assess the risk on their platform, the risk uh, arising from interaction with that, uh, that user-to-user or search content. And there are three, uh, three broad sub-issues we need to talk about here. First of all, illegal content. So services have to remove any illegal content that on their platform. And the, 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 there were a certain number of priority offences which were included in the bill where services will actively need to search out this kind of content. So we're talking there about uh, child sexual abuse material, uh, grooming material, uh, uh, terrorists that, su that supports or advocates for terrorism, excuse me, content that supports and advocates for terrorism, uh, all contents, uh, a whole variety of, of other offences as well. There's also some interesting ones in there about um, uh, sale of weapons and knives to uh, to children, uh, and a few other a few other offences that uh, have not really been discussed in the in the context of online regulation in the past. So that's an interesting uh, an interesting area. There's also uh, uh, an area of legal harms to children. So the Secretary of State will specify some harms that um, that children should be protect, prote protected or prevented from encountering. So we're talking now about suicide and self-harm content, or I should, actually I should say content uh, which promotes suicide and self-harm, content which promotes eating disorders, uh, content which promotes violence and harmful health and mis- and disinformation. There's a few others as well that the government is considering there. The duty there is not to remove that content, which is legal um, and perfectly acceptable for adults to access it, but uh, to prevent children from ordinarily encountering it. And here, uh, just to remember, a child is anybody who's under the age of 18. Uh, so that, that duty applies right from the youngest internet users, some of whom we found are, are three or four years old in, uh, who are uh, being shown videos on TikTok, all the way up to, uh, to a 17-year-old. They'll need to be prevented from encountering this kind of content. And there's also uh, what we call user empowerment duties. So uh, this is a, a relatively new addition to the bill and it replaces the uh, legal but harmful uh, to adults category of, of content. Here, services will be required to provide tools to users so that they can choose whether there's a certain type of content that they would like to encounter or not. For example, and there's a, there's a strong match here with some of those categories for the uh, children, we're talking here again about suicide and self-harm content and, and those kind of things. There, uh, these are controversial areas, I, I should say, and I'm sure we'll get into discussion about the implications of those. Uh, here's our timeline, or uh, <laughs> this, is, this is slightly optimistic, and it was certainly produced a, a few months ago. We were anticipating at this time that the bill would receive royal assent uh, in the early part of 2023 and we'd be able to start our work in earnest at that point. It's clear that isn't going to happen, um, and there's certainly going to be some months delay caused by, uh, well, I think we've had two Secretaries of State since um, 
uh, since the substantive common stages in the summer. Uh, there's certainly going to be lots more discussion when we get to the Lords. This timetable will certainly be, be out of date. But this is our, our broad roadmap. We're planning to, uh, are planning to, to consult on some, uh, on some of our illegal content duties in the early part of next year. We'll consult on the children's safety duties in the later part of next year. And then the larger parts of the regime will come into, into force during the course of 2024, hopefully, the child safety duties by the end of 2024. There will be some duties that will that will uh, come on later on. I mentioned those categorization uh, issues. So uh, those largest reach and largest risk services will need to publish some summaries of their risk assessments. Um, that, that, that kind of work won't start really in earnest until 2025. I think that's probably, uh, that's probably enough for now, but it's, it's suffice it to say that, that uh, as the broadcast regulator, uh, we are really looking forward to this work. We already regulate some of the services we're talking about under the video sharing platform regime. So TikTok, Twitch, some parts of Snapchat, uh, uh, Discord, BitChute, some of these other services, and a large, large number of um, small pornographic services we already regulate uh, on these services that allow users to share um, users and uh, to share videos and comment on each other. That's uh, we're learning from that experience. Um, it's definitely different being a regulator of online services uh, in comparison to being a regulator of, say, postal services or uh, or broadcast, where there's a strong culture of of compliance. These services are also uh, learning how to be regulated, and I think we have to acknowledge that this is we're on a journey here, and it's not going to be perfect on day one. The the answer to all online harms. Uh, is not at uh, the end of 2024 when the child safety duties and the online safety bill come into force. Um, we think that, uh, that there's going to be a, a significant change happening at that point, but things will get better over the course of um, the two or three years following. And we should remember, we're not the only people doing this work. So there are also uh, uh, regulators in Ireland, um, in the EU, of course, with the Digital Services Act, and in several other jurisdictions around the world where many of these companies also operate. So we, as the regulator, are trying to do a bit of work with those other regulators, make sure that we understand the implications of each of the regime, make it as simple as possible for services to comply so that we can avoid uh, regulatory clash and, uh, and overburdensome uh, uh, rules. I think that's it for now, um, but I'm happy to take any questions or to save them for later, Jeff. Great. Thanks so much, Tony. That's great. Well, I think we'll, we'll move to the questions after, after we've <coughs> chatted a bit. Um, so we're now going to turn to Maeve Walsh from Carnegie who's going to offer us her perspective on the bill. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Jeff, for, for having me here. Um, uh, so I've been working with Carnegie UK as an associate for the last uh, four years or so. Um, and for those of you who might not know Carnegie, it's uh, the UK uh, branch of it anyway, is a, a small not-for-profit organisation based in Dunfermline that has a remit to improve the well-being of the people of the UK and Ireland. And we do that in a number of different ways through policy and, and community kind of practice programmes too. Uh, one of the biggest pieces of work that uh, we've been involved in the last uh, uh, four years is on uh, the development of proposals uh, to uh, reduce uh, on online harms. Um, and with Will Perrin, who's a uh, trustee at Carnegie, and Professor Lorna Woods, who's a professor of internet law at uh, the University of Essex, uh, we originally developed the idea of um, uh, applying a duty of care on uh, social media companies to reduce the risk of reasonably foreseeable harms occurring on their services. And that was very much based on health and safety law um, and on the principle that um, there was a sort of narrative uh, four or five years ago, and there probably still is now to an extent, that somehow tech companies were uh, exceptional, that, uh, that they couldn't be regulated like normal businesses, um, and that therefore some of the things, some of the harms that they were um, uh, facilitating or allowing to happen on their platforms, whether to individual users or to society, uh, could not in any way be sort of reined in. Um, so by using the duty of care approach and using a sort of risk-based um, approach and proportionate approach to, to regulation, um, uh, Will Perrin and, and, and Professor Lorna Woods um, started the debate, I think, on, on how we might approach that. 
Um, so in terms of what we, we would welcome, and I would welcome in the bill, is the fact that some of those proposals sort of still are in the bill. I mean, the bill has become very complex um, over the, the number of years it's been in development, but it's still fundamentally a risk-based regime. So in terms of the illegal content duties that uh, Tony uh, talked about and the duties um, regarding children, um, those require platforms to undertake risk assessments, um, to look at uh, the way their service is, is designed, the way it's operated, uh, the functionalities it has, um, and to identify um, how those particular aspects of their services might uh, um, increase the risk of um, either illegal content or, or harm to children um, uh, arising on the service. Um, and then the safety duties uh, require them uh, to put in place a, a mitigation plan to uh, to reduce those risks. So that's you know kind of standard um, practice in any other regulated sector uh, really in the um, in the in the world at the moment. Uh, so that's still there. Um, and, it, and I suppose another uh, reason to, to, to welcome uh, the bill is the fact that we do still have a bill. Um, I mean, obviously, as, as, uh, as Tony's uh, alluded to and, and Jeff, it's been a very long and convoluted uh, process. And uh, I mean, in total, there have been seven DCMS secretaries of state involved in this uh, uh, policy and legislative uh, development uh, process. As you say, three prime ministers uh, involved in it uh, this year, uh, four in total, if you include uh, Theresa May, um, and huge amounts of, of, of churn in terms of of, of um, uh, the uh, officials and, and other people working, uh, working on the bill in DCMS. Um, but it's one of the most scrutinised pieces of legislation already, um, notwithstanding the fact that it's gone back into committee uh, this week uh, uh, too. Um, there have been three committee uh, um, processes already um, overseeing it. There was a draft bill, there have been numerous uh, policy uh, uh, discussions and, and evidence sessions in Parliament. So this isn't something that, uh, uh, that is uh, wanting for, for scrutiny and analysis. Um, so I think the fact that we are actually looking now at uh, an end in sight, uh, albeit one that is still uh, uh, further away than we'd like, is, is to be welcomed. Um, and the government has committed to getting the bill through um, in this uh, session of Parliament as well. Um, although we've heard today that I think the session is going to be extended until November, so which is good in some ways in terms of allowing the House of Lords, who are going to receive it in the uh, new year, uh, to continue to scrutinise it and, and hopefully to kind of improve it further. Uh, but in terms of Ofcom's uh, roadmap and those very uh, finely honed uh, timescales, um, I think the uh, the end dates are, are being pushed, you know, further to, to the right there as well. Um, so it's a huge step, as Tony said, it's not perfect, um, but uh, it's, it's, it's largely and, uh, and widely kind of needed to address the types of, of harms that, uh, that we see online. Um, we do um, at Carnegie have some concerns, and I think we're going to get onto these in, in the discussion uh, more generally, um, about the removal of the adult safety duties, um, which is the, the focus of the committee uh, discussion this week. Um, we're not convinced that the, uh, the so-called government triple shield uh, that, uh, that is there to be um, in place of those adult safety duties will be effective. Um, and we do think that the removal of, of the risk assessment in that part of the bill, as I said earlier, there's a risk assessment related to illegal content and to the content um, uh, harms to children uh, content. The removal of risk assessment in terms of harms to adults, I think, makes it very difficult to assess the efficacy of what the platforms do uh, in relation to the new duties. Um, and those duties are, are, are to, uh, to ensure that they enforce their terms and conditions um, and also to, uh, to improve the user empowerment duties um, uh, for, for users of those services. Um, we've also got some long-standing concerns about uh, the extent of the Secretary of State powers in the bill, um, and these are shared, I think, across civil society and, in fact, across uh, uh, political parties as well. Um, there are uh, some rather unnecessary um, uh, powers that allow the Secretary of State to interfere uh, in Ofcom's codes of practice um, on the grounds of public policy. Um, and there are a number of, of, of different um, areas in the bill where the Secretary of State also can affair, interfere in Ofcom's sort of day-to-day -day running of the regime. So in terms of having an independent regulatory regime, which for something that does involve regulating speech to a certain extent, um, we think that that actually is, is going to be very problematic. Um, and uh, obviously, regardless of the political political persuasion of the Secretary of State at the time, uh, it's not something in, in setting up an independent regulatory regime that you want to bake in from, from the start. Um, and finally, there are a few other areas um, which are related to the, the changes um, uh, to do with the adult safety duty, where we think there are gaps. 
um, in the uh, in the legislation. Uh, one is around um, uh, addressing violence against women and girls. Um, uh, there are a number of new offences that have been added to the um, uh, schedule of offences in the bill um, that do address some of the particular uh, kind of criminal and legal activity that women and girls face online. Um, but we feel that there is a particular um, uh, combination of harms uh, that women and girls face in that particular kind of information uh, ecosystem, if you like, um, that should be uh, more broadly addressed by a code of practice um, uh, attached to the bill. Um, and at Carnegie, we've been working with a number of, of um, civil society organisations that campaign um, against violence against women and girls uh, to develop uh, such a code of practice. Um, and we've written to the Secretary of State actually today to ask that that's um, added to, to the bill. Um, we also feel there are gaps, um, and some of these have been debated in the last couple of weeks um, uh, in, in the Commons, uh, around extremism um, uh, in the bill. Um, obviously, uh, extremism below, is below the category of, sort of illegal uh, content, but often is the way in which uh, people and individuals are, are radicalised into committing um, uh, illegal and, and criminal offences offline. Um, and we do feel that there should be some way, whether it's in the user empowerment duties or elsewhere, that that is, uh, that is included. Um, and similarly with myths and disinformation. Um, so one of the things that's dropped out of the, the government's uh, list of, of things that would have been covered by the adult safety duties is health misinformation. Um, it's not been read across into the user empowerment duties and there's been no real um, uh, reasoning given by the government as to, to why that is. Um, so I think there's a further debate to be, uh, to be had um, there too. Um, and then finally, I think our, our concern, again, going back to the, the timescales, is how long this is going to take to be implemented. I mean, obviously, rightly, Ofcom, as the regulator, uh, does have a um, uh, requirement to consult broadly and to ensure that codes of practice that uh, companies are, are required to, uh, uh, to abide by are, uh, are robust and, 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 and well worked through. But there's also an awful lot of secondary legislation that has to uh, uh, come into force, particularly on the children's duties, before Ofcom can even begin to consult. So given where we started in terms of the delays uh, in, in developing this policy and getting the bill to this stage, there is quite a long tail now, I think, until that, that regime is, is fully going to be implemented. Um, and all of that does lead to you know, further uncertainty, um, both for users and indeed for companies that are going to be regulated as well as to what it is they need to comply with uh, when the regime is fully in force. Um, so I'll leave that there, but look forward to uh, continuing the discussion. <coughs> Great. Thanks so much, Maeve. And now we're going to hear from Ruth Smith from Index on Censorship. Um, good evening. I, you know, I'm having a very odd week, so I apologise in advance, but um, when Jeff said I joined the House of Lords in uh, 2022, what he really meant is last Thursday. <laughs> so um, I am completely confused. I've also changed my name, so I'm now Ruth Anderson, gone back to my major name, has completely confused everybody. And in no small part, it is because of the conversation that we're having. So I'm going to probably completely confuse you, but I need to start with... Um, why I, um, with my own experiences of what happened to me online, and then talk about why I think that um, actually the online safety bill is not going to make me or probably anyone else safer in its current iteration. I'm really sorry, both of you. Um, so I was a Labour member of Parliament. I was a Jewish Labour member of Parliament at a time when being Jewish in the political world and definitely in the Labour Party was not straightforward. Um, my own personal experiences, and it was... Um, I had everything from someone wrote a 1,500-word essay on Facebook of how they were going to merger me to um, thousands, and I mean thousands, of pieces of misogynist and um, anti-Jewish hate pieces of abuse, and it continues to this day. And I had everything from abuse to, well, from banter to abuse to threats to something that went beyond threats based on my identity, based on... Um, people, um, not even based ever on what I was doing politically, but based on who I was. So you'd assume that I would want very, 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 very strict um, uh, online safety legislation. And there's a big part of me that would. There are lots of moments over the last seven years when, oh my God, I've wanted to turn the internet off. But that is not the answer, apparently. I mean, it would undermine my shopping experiences, but still. Um, <laughs> But this legislation doesn't give me that. And one of the things why it really doesn't give me protection, in my opinion, which was the answer to the question, is on illegal content, so let's start with illegal content, um, it's going to be automatically deleted. 
So tell me how anyone's going to prosecute those people that have just threatened to murder me. Tell me how anyone's going to prosecute for any of the violence against women and girls legislation that wants added to the bill. Explain to me how I'm safer when I don't know that someone's threatened me because it's been deleted before I see it. I won't know. And I have been arguing for a long time that there needs to be a digital evidence locker where those things can be moved to. The government aren't doing it. So I don't know how I'm going to be safer. And, I, and one of the things that, if you've experienced, if you've ever been in the middle of a social media storm, I knew I was more vulnerable when, my, when the number of uh, mentions went up. I won't know those either, because I'm pretty sure that some of the language, in fact, I know some of the language used about me, my mother should never see, but more than that, um, it probably would trigger some form of process, including the friction process. So I have huge nervousness on a personal level that I won't necessarily be safer. But that also, I run, I have the privilege and honour of running a free speech organisation. Now, I am not the left-wing Toby Young, I promise you. But I publish the work of dissidents around the world. I work with, an, um, with the Syrian War Archive. And already, because of the nature of what they record, we've just had the first prosecutions of war crimes based on evidence gathered on social media. That is extraordinary. But if the Syrian War Archive didn't exist, a third of what they captured had already been deleted when they went back onto the mainstream platforms to find out where it, um, to verify it. We will lose the evidence of what we need because it does include illegal activity. Of course it does. It's evidence of war crimes. It's evidence of rape. It's evidence of bombs. It's evidence of violence. So that is a genuine issue about what this legislation does. And that's just on, that's on the really serious grown-up side of this legislation. This legislation is not all serious and grown-up. It is currently 230 pages long. And the amendments haven't finished. And it has not yet got to the House of Lords. It has been going for seven years. Now, I hate to remind everyone of what's happened in the last seven years, but if you just think TikTok didn't exist when this legislation first came into its inception, and it is being done, and I say this as someone who has just joined the House of Lords, but I am 30 years younger than the average age of people in the House of Lords. I'm going to be young for a really long time. <laughs> but I am also, but I used to also be a Member of Parliament. I was 20 years younger than the average Member of Parliament. How many of them do you think do their own social media? How many of them, and they are now sitting there legislating about technology, that honestly, and I include my own experiences, when my, when my social media exploded, I didn't look at my social media again for three years. My staff did my social media. People protected me. I never saw it. I didn't know what protections had changed, what systems had changed. And I worry that some of the people that are now exploring and legislating for this not necessarily their area of expertise. I mean, some of them are brilliant on it. Some of them, not so much. So there's a huge amount of power here that's sitting with civil servants. Um, there's also, um, you know, the Secretary of State powers we would all agree on. Um, but there's also some, because we've had so many Secretaries of State that have touched this legislation, we've also had several Home Secretaries that have touched this legislation. And they keep changing their mind because we've had so many of them. But what they haven't done is deleted any of the enabling clauses in the legislation. So there's lots of parts of it that are contradictory. There's also parts of this legislation that we're not sure if the government really want it in there or not. But in case you haven't noticed, the government have had a little bit of a stressful few months, years decade. I mean, I'm on the other side, so I would say that. But now they can't really admit that some of the stuff in this legislation wasn't meant to be there all along. And one of the things that's in this legislation is the end of end-to-end -end encryption. Bye-bye WhatsApp. Bye-bye Signal. And WhatsApp have already said that they'll pull out of the UK if this goes through in its current iteration. Because you can't, because once you break end to end encryption, it's broken. <laughs> like you can't just have a little bit broken. And we think about how you look, you know, end to end encryption, I and I am not a tech special, I'm not that, I'm not a geeky tech person. I really wish I was. I really wish I understood the algorithms. And that's actually one of the most important things that Ofcom are going to have to do because they'll see the algorithms that the platforms use. But one of the things for me, is the end-to-end -end encryption stuff. I speak to dissidents who are in Hong Kong, who are in Afghanistan, 
who are in Belarus. They won't trust those platforms anymore. Because why would they? But also, if you think about it in your day-to-day -day life, how much do your parents love sending embarrassing baby photos? Or when your friends have had children? They do that on WhatsApp because they know they're completely protected. Children in the bath? Going to send those photos? They're family photos. They're in family WhatsApp groups. The undermining of end-to-end -end encryption could undermine how we, in, how we interact in our normal lives, also in our commercial lives. But I am a fixer in my natural iteration, as much as I, I know how much I would have wound up both of you when about legal but harmful over the last 18 months. But it's what, what, how do we fix this? Now, one of the ways in which we need to fix this is actually there, there should have been two or three bills, not just one, and one of them should have about how we trade and how we market and other things. But also, we've got to look very carefully about when the legislation comes to the House of Lords, because apparently I am told, I'm, I, hopefully it's not just a selling point for why I've gone in, but I am told that that's where the real work will be done to try and make this sane. But, we've got, um, but that's where some of the things will be fixed. The only other thing I'd like to raise, because I think it's an area of interest, one of the um, issues here about children being protected, no one should argue against that ever. The question is, however, how are we going to do it in terms of the technology? Because if you're going to protect children, you're going to have to verify everyone's account to prove you're not a child. Now, if you're a dissident, or if you're from a vulnerable community, how comfortable are you going to be with certain with what body holding your data? I speak every week to someone who is a, a dissident in Hong Kong who's part of the insurgency, as I like to think of him. We do it via Twitter because he's got online anonymity and that's the safest way for him. No one knows who he is. It's a safe way for him to engage. That's the, at his behest. If he's got to verify who he is, that's a problem. So we've got to make sure that the technology is being used in such a way that by making children safe, we're not making other people more vulnerable. So there's still lots of questions around this legislation. 230 pages in, seven years in, four prime ministers, seven secretaries of state. So it's very complicated. It's also, um, in my personal opinion, before I get in lots of trouble, especially given what I just said about seven years, this is new technology. Relatively speaking, in the history of communications, this is still new technology. We didn't have TikTok five years ago. 15 years ago, we didn't have Facebook. We don't know what tech platforms we're going to be using in five years' time. I would want to build into the legislation a sunset clause or a review point in five years to see what's working and what isn't working, because I think we should do that on legislation anyway. Um, but that sort of... So, Slightly different stance. I'm really sorry. Don't hate me. It's just before Christmas. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ruth. Great. So we're going to dig into it now, and we're going to try to touch on a bunch of the points that were already raised and try to explore some potential lines of, of disagreement among our panelists. There are three big buckets of content that I'd like to tuck into. So one has to do with whether the regime adequately respects free speech, and we've already heard a bit of chat on that. The second is whether the new regime adequately protects children, and if so, how. And finally, questions about whether the regime adequately protects adults and prevents wider social harm. So let's, let's start by digging into that free speech issue right away. And I'd love to just pick up where Ruth left off um, with respect to the duties that platforms have um, on illegal content. And there are a number of worries that people have about those provisions. So one might be that it incentivizes over-removal of legitimate speech. For example, the bill requires platforms to remove speech that it has reasonable grounds to infer is illegal, not that's obviously legal or overwhelmingly illegal. And so there's a question about whether it might remove illegal speech. But then Ruth raises this issue about the record and whether if this illegal content is removed, whether that will hamper the prospect of criminal prosecutions. And I wonder whether Ruth or Tony has any thoughts, Ruth in terms of her, her wider opinions, or, or sorry, Maeve and Tony, Maeve in terms of her wider opinions on the issue and Tony in terms of the logistics of how Ofcom is gonna deal with this on either of those points. 
first? Shall I jump? Uh, 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 how Ofcom is going to deal with it? A good, a good question, Jeff. Just, just to be clear, Ofcom, uh, we are ready to take on this role. We have not yet, and we are only halfway through the bill, and uh, we are expecting there will be some changes to its passage in the Lords. This always happens with all legislation. It always actually tends to get longer as it goes through the Lords rather than shorter. Um, so we will uh, we'll set out some more of our approach to this. Uh, well, we were going to do it in the spring. Who knows where we'll, what, what time scale we'll actually do it on. Um, uh, there are some duties on, on the, the services, as you said, Jeff, to remove this content, to proactively, in some cases, search for illegal content and, and take action on it when it's flagged to them as well. Um, there are also duties on them to, uh, uh, to take into account um, freedom of expression um, and the need to protect journalistic content and content that's of democratic importance. We'll set out... I think some guidance on how companies uh, can do that, but they all will all have to take uh, action in light of the risk assessment that they've had to do. So they will have to understand the interplay between the type of content that's posted to their service, the user base that they have, the features that they have that may encourage or or disincentivize spread of content that may be harmful uh, or illegal, um, uh, and a whole range of other issues that they are. That it doesn't that 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 they're all interplay to create a risky riskier or less risky environment um, so so a lot of the, a lot of the actions they take will come back to exactly how they approach that risk assessment whether they do it in a really expansive way really trying to understand um, uh, the, some of the, the impacts of some of the content that Ruth was talking about um, or whether they do it in a fairly uh, lackadaisical way and, and simply, as you talked about Jeff, may, maybe wanting to overblock. It's worth saying that lots of the content that we are concerned about in, under illegal, uh, the illegal content duties is already against the terms of service of these, uh, of these companies, the largest ones anyway. Um, those terms of service are not... Uh, by and large consistently applied across all services, it's incredibly difficult to do that. One of the main things, uh, the main impacts that I expect will happen will be that services will start to apply those terms of service rather, rather more rigorously, rather more consistently. And that, I think, is what users already expect uh, from the platforms. And, they, uh, and, and certainly, uh, we get a number of complaints every, uh, every day coming into Ofcom, even though we haven't got the duty yet, um, from people who say that they've seen this piece of content uh, up on one of the services, that, uh, that they reported it because it's obviously violative or it's obviously illegal, and the service did nothing about it. That is one of the things that we think will change. Great, mate. Sorry, can I just want you yeah, to, yeah, no, I just, one of the things that if you're, we're going to talk about free speech and the protection of democratic, uh, of content that's democratically important and journalist content, and this isn't an Ofcom thing, this is a government thing, um, the Department for uh, Digital Culture and Media and Sport has never been able to define what a journalist is. Um, so one of the issues that we're going to have in terms of defending and protecting journalist content or democratic content is what is it? So, for example, the, um, the person that recorded the video of George Floyd, I'd say at that moment they were a citizen journalist. Would they be covered? Or was, because what they were recording so violent, would it have been deleted? Tommy Robinson calls himself a citizen journalist. He's also stood for election, thankfully never been elected, but has stood for election. Is he going to be protected by this legislation? We don't know, because we don't know what a definition of journalist is going to be. I run an organisation that publishes a quarterly magazine and I write for it every week. I should be protected. I'm not a journalist. I am now a politician again. But up until a week ago, I was someone that had lost an election who talked a great deal about politics. Is my, are my views important or democratically protected? And when are they and why should they be? One of the proposals, which is contrary to the whole ethos of the bill, is that during a general election campaign, anything targeted at an elect a potential politician would be protected under democratic um, speech, which is fine, except in the 2019 general election, I got two death threats. I'm not sure that that should be protected at that point. I wanted them nicked. So I think we've got to be really careful about what the definitions are, because we don't have them yet. We don't have them yet, again, after seven years, and actually, for journalism, after 250 years of debating what is and is not a journalist. 
Uh, just to, to come up very quickly, Jen, you really don't need to worry about uh, offending me. Um, uh, as the as the regulator, we don't have responsibility for the the bill. <laughs> now nah, you've just got to do it. I'm really, well, and that's, that is the more difficult part, even e even after this. And, and I, I I take your point, by the way, on. Um, on length of time, I, I before I joined Ofcom, uh, I worked in the children's sector and I was campaigning for protection, greater protections for children online. And I've been working on this, what is now the online safety bill, since 2016. Uh, so, uh, so this is a this is a very long process to get to here, and there's there's some way to go before we get to the end. Uh, okay, just to come back to the, I, I, I completely take your point about definitions, um, just to come back to the, the discussion about illegal content. Um, I think if we kind of take a step back, I mean, we're, we're here discussing um, a, a regulatory framework to deal with uh, illegal content in this way because the kind of criminal law has failed in, the, in this sense, or criminal enfor enforcement of the criminal law online has failed. So if you look at um, uh, some of the offences that are listed in, in Schedule 7, they include fraud. Um, the scale of fraud online, the amount of, of losses to individuals and, and, and uh, other online users is vast. Um, the City of London Police um, have been lobbying the government for, and, and indeed the FCA, it's quite unheard of for a regulator, I'm sure Ofcom wouldn't do it, to quite so aggressively uh, lobby the, the government for, for fraud and for scams to be put into the bill because the existing enforcement um, uh, measures and indeed the criminal enforcement measures have failed because of the scale of it. So what the illegal content uh, duties, by being based on, on a, a risk assessment process, um, uh, require from, from companies, it's within the context of a civil regulatory regime. So it's saying to them, you need to do, you have the right systems and processes in place to try and prevent this, uh, uh, this content from um, proliferating online. Um, if um, that, the, those individual pieces of content um, are um, illegal, then they should be taken down. Um, and again, I completely accept your point about what happens to that content and what that means then in terms of kind of criminal enforcement. Um, but the, um, the uh, and then as Tony said as well, the platform should already be doing that. But this is effectively saying that Ofcom can come in to, and, and say to them, well, where are your systems for doing this? And let's look at how, how successful those, those are at the moment. Because at the moment, there is, not, there is none of that sort of accountability um, at all uh, for it. Um, but what um, uh, the bill doesn't do, though, um, and because of the way that, that, that parliamentarians over the course of the, the, the long uh, debates on the bill um, have, have, have lent on this, um, is um, criminalised speech online that isn't already criminalised offline. So this is why we've got the long list of offences in the bill, and it's why uh, over the course of the, of particularly the last few months, um, the government has moved away now from from the the, the kind of uh, uh, the idea of harms to adults that aren't uh, aren't illegal or, or aren't uh, aren't criminal. So I think we are in a position where um, you know the bill is is trying to do as much as it can in order to rebalance an environment that actually you know um, uh, has been. And I, I I don't want to use the term, term Wild West. People refer to it as Wild West, but there is that sense that there hasn't been uh, the effective enforcement of, of things online that should be that should be there. And this is the way by which the plan platforms now are going to be asked to prove that they're doing that. Yeah, Ruth? Yeah, I just, so one, I don't genuinely disagree with most of that, but one of the issues here is we've just spoken for 45 minutes collectively, or 40 minutes collectively, and none of us have talked about the people who use the platforms. Not really. And one of the issues that this legislation is trying to legislate cultural change online. That's fundamentally, we should all be nicer to each other. You'll hear lots of politicians talk about, um, we want to take away the hate online, we want it to be a nice place, a utopia online, right? The safest place, the nicest place to be, to use the internet. The word education doesn't exist in the 230 pages it was been removed. So there's no education program that goes alongside it. The legislation of cultural change Illegal content, just what you know. So what we, what this actually does, and it's a politician's fix, and I get to say that as a politician, it's um, it's so that they can go to their lower lecture and say we've done something, because it doesn't actually do anything to change the culture online. It doesn't build in friction to make sure that people, yeah, you know, in an ideal world, right. So, twenty years ago, if you were going to write something horrible to a politician or a public figure, they used to be called green ink letters. You go and get the green ink, you get an envelope. You had to write the letter, you had to buy the stamp, you had to walk to the post office. It was like a whole performance. And then you'd send the letter, and most people had a box of green ink letters. Now it's 30, you know, it's 30 seconds at one o'clock in the morning from your bedroom, right? Like it takes no time at all. 
If you put up something that included keywords and it wasn't posted for two hours and you had to verify it to say you were going to do it again, you might not be quite so abusive after a football match if you'd had to think about it. That is one of the things that might come through. Well, yeah, I, yeah, just keep comment because I, mean, I think if you, this is the point about the risk assessment. If you actually look even on the illegal content duties and it was there on the harms to adults before it's been taken out, it does talk. It talks about the functionalities of the service. It talks about the systems, the processes, the way it works, the way the algorithms work and so forth. So if that is, is, is properly kind of enforced then by Ofcom, it would be incumbent on Ofcom to say, well, actually, you have got a problem in your platform with users doing exactly that. So whether it's illegal, whether it's death threats, which obviously are, are criminal offences and need to be um, uh, you know, reported to the police and acted on, or whether it's just large-scale volumes of harassment or abuse or whatever else, if the platform's functionality allows users to exactly do that. I mean, the, the big example that, that, that's been used in the last uh, year or so is obviously the abuse that was directed at the uh, Black England footballers yeah. after the Euros last year. So that was abuse directed at individuals online, mm -hmm. obviously lots of people at the same time doing it, but the... Um, uh, cumulative effect of that, of of the number of users seeing that abuse and piling in on it, the effect of that in terms of the volume that those individuals were getting, that is something that you know the platforms could have prepared for. They knew there was a European Football Championship coming up. They knew there was likelihood that England were going to go out on penalties. You know that always happens. So what was likely to happen after that? There but was some going of the to platforms be abuse did. Online. YouTube did. YouTube, yeah, YouTube maybe did, but I mean, Instagram had a terrible problem yeah. with that, and and you know, and Twitter as well. So there are things that, that and that's the risk assessment pre that duty, which unfortunately, with some of the harms to adult stuff going, isn't going to be there for that type but, of abuse. But for illegal content, it should be. But can I make it, because one of the things that's really, and it comes back to the cultural change online, because several of the footballers said they didn't want that content deleted. Mm. They, because they wanted to see, they wanted the general public to see what they experienced on a daily basis. And that had been a horrible experience in a 24 hour period. But they wanted people to see what really happens to black football players. And I think, and, you know, and Luciana Berger, who was another Jewish politician, she would retweet all of her abuse. Like, I never wanted to see it. She needed to see all of it. And she wanted it to share because people deal with this in, yeah. And, I'm talking to a, an audience of people who definitely at various points would have either experienced racism or misogyny or abuse. Everyone deals with it differently. There is no easy way to deal with it. But the, but the one way, in my opinion, which is why I run a free expression organisation, is deleting it is pretending it doesn't exist. And that does not make either the world better or me safer. Ruth, you might think that platforms have a moral obligation to engage in this kind of content moderation, but that, platform, but that the law just shouldn't enforce that moral obligation as a, as a legal duty. And I think most people in, in the United States have something like that view, given that the First Amendment blocks the, the possibility of legislation like this in the US. But it sounds like the argument you're saying don't just push back against legal regulation. It also suggests that platforms themselves, as a private matter, should just be doing way less content moderation. No, Is actually, that right? No, I don't think that at all. I think that they have a... I think that so currently one of my issues about the illegal content being deleted, content um, the um, the platforms legally won't be allowed to store it. They're not legally allowed to hold illegal material because that would be an illegal act. So actually, I want them to be able to facilitate this better. Like I have, um, I can you know I have prosecute people have been prosecuted for what they've said about me online. I am not in a position where I'm going to say, oh, yeah, no, of course, everyone can say whatever they want online. I am a free speech advocate. I'm not a free speech absolutist. I think there are consequences to your actions. You know, anti-Semitism in the Labour Party, I wanted them thrown out of the Labour Party. I wasn't saying that they had to stop talking, right? There, is a, there are consequences. They didn't get to be in my club if they were racist. It wasn't that they you know, had to leave society. I think we've just got to be really careful about what we're talking about and the other part of this is i think that there are more imaginative innovative ways than legislation especially if you're and candidly if you're legislating for the platforms of yesterday not the platforms of tomorrow i don't know how this is going to work for the metaverse i don't know how this is going to work for whatever platform emerges tomorrow because none of us will and i don't know what the unintended consequences are but no one does of any legislation but what I can tell you is when something's 230 pages long, it's still got the enabling clauses of things that have been deleted. It's not going to work. Tony, thoughts on future-proofing? Yeah, that's, uh, it's really interesting. I, I, the, 
the bill is, despite the 230 pages, is largely principles based. So I talked earlier on about the, the duties that services will have to adhere to. We're going to give them some guidance in terms of codes of practice. So we'll set out what we think services need to do to, uh, uh, to meet those duties. But actually, they could decide that they want to meet the duty in a completely different way that is appropriate for the type of service that they have, maybe because they have a different risk profile or because they have a different, uh, a, a different attitude to, to dealing with it. That they don't have to do what we tell them to do. So in that sense, there will always be ways for new services that want to approach this in a different way as long as they can meet the, those overriding duties. Now, I think that is that is relatively future-proof. You're absolutely right, of course, Ruth, that nothing can take into account every future possibility. That's why there are review clauses built into the bill. So three years after Royal Assent, Ofcom will have to uh, do some work and publish a report exactly to say what has the impact been of this um, uh, of this uh, work on the illegal content and the child safety duties. And that will be uh, that will feed into future amendments to the legislation, of course. We will also be keeping our codes of practice, that, that guidance on our services, um, we'll, we'll be keeping that up to date. As w our understanding of the, of the threats changes, as users' behaviour changes, and of course as services change over the course of the, that period. And the, those services will change not just in, uh, in response to the regulation, they'll change in, in response to the threats that are changing, and they'll also change in response to uh, other regulation that's happening in, in Europe with the DSA and um, certainly in Canada, Australia and New Zealand as well. I just want to make a point about uh, education, which might actually take us into the children's uh, issue. Um, this, this argument gets, gets put around quite a lot that there's, a, there's not an education campaign built into the bill. That's certainly true. Um, and users do have a part to play in this. There's not only are there the user empowerment tools that are, are built into it. Uh, there is uh, the, there's there's requirements on the services to explain their terms and conditions in a, a way that is appropriate to uh, to their users. So, for instance, for children, uh, we 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 might expect. And just to be clear, this isn't what Ofcom is going to do. But um, we might expect that services would start to present their terms and conditions and reporting mechanisms in a way that is appropriate to the age and development stage of their users. So. If it's a child, it might be more appropriate to produce it in, let's say, an animation format or something else that makes it easier for children to participate. There are various education and behaviour change campaigns out there. So, uh, for instance, in England, it's now a statutory subject in school. PSHE is statutory. Every child needs to be taught, uh, whatever type of school they attend, um, uh, the impact of uh, online safety and ways to keep yourself safer online. So there is some of that uh, education piece in there. But we don't rely in any other um, area where regulation is required. We don't rely on end users to make changes. We rely on creating a systems and processes um, that help users make the right choices and keep them safe. And for, we've talked in the past about um, swimming pools being one example. We don't let children uh, jump into a swimming pool uh, without knowing how to swim. But we also don't leave them to it when, when they're there. We make sure that, um, that there are lifeguards and there are... There are um, uh, rescue rings and those kind of things but we also have a society in the pool that looks out for people who are in trouble um, and that's probably I think where the piece is missing here so uh, we have not in the online sphere it's much more difficult to get bystanders to intervene uh, and that's where I think some of the education campaign uh, both from Ofcom in our media literacy duties but also in the um, uh, through schools and other civil society organizations has a bigger part to play yeah um, yeah, but I just follow on on that. I, I totally agree with, uh, with with what Tony said there about the balance between education and, and, uh, and regulation. Um, there's a particular gap, however, in the bill um, uh, with regard to mis and disinformation um, and media literacy. However, so in previous versions of the bill, if you go back, I don't know how many months, uh, there was a requirement um, uh, around media literacy um, that the government removed from the bill, citing the fact that Ofcom already have media literacy duty or duties to promote media literacy. Um, however, the problem is when the government are um, uh, pushed then on why the bill doesn't do anything on mis and disinformation, and I mean, obviously, it's a big and, and, and thorny subject, uh, they point to the fact that media literacy is part of the answer, but without having uh, beefed up media literacy duties in the bill. So I think there is this circular argument, really, in terms of, of um, what uh, users, and this is not just children, this is adult users as well, um, are expected to be able to do in order to critically evaluate pieces 
case of, 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 of um, uh, mis or disinformation or conspiracy theories or whatever uh, in uh, on, on platforms where potentially they are being again shared at scale or promoted at scale um, without having the necessarily kind of necessary tools and understanding to do that but also they're not having a, a, a not, they're not being a responsibility on, on platforms to do more to try and kind of uh, reduce that, that spread in the first instance Tom should do the statistics Ofcom did an amazing piece of research earlier the year this year which had the statistics of misinforma misinformation and disinformation and it was something yeah. like um, 60 percent of people believe that they'd be able to, or 70 percent of people believe they'd be able to identify mm. you're going to tell me the right stats right no, otherwise no. No, okay <laughs> so I'm going to make them up then yeah um, so here's my own bit of disinformation um, but uh, 70 percent of uh, people thought that they could identify um, fake news on social media and then the follow-up was like only 20 percent of them actually could yeah. so when it, we talk about I mean some of this stuff is about online bullying and especially when you're talking about people below the age of 18 but actually what we need is digital citizenship and we need people to be retaught analytical skills you know when in 1997 it was a good year for you know my political world um 90 um, percent of people got their news sources from a bbc outlet that's now about 45 percent um, so social media and everything else has changed in that time. That people take their news from sources they opt into as opposed to generic news outlets. So what we've got to do, we never have, you know, we had a very good public broadcasting news arrangement. We now need to look at how you empower people so that they question the news sources. That will also help with conspiracy theories and misinformation and disinformation. And that should be done as we did when we first got the internet, I'm saying, I sound like I'm 102, and for some of you, I will be compared to someone who's 102. But when we first got the internet, it wasn't just schools where people were taught how to use it. The WI was involved. Like, every, every library had classes for every age, so that it was a new skill set. And that's what we need. We need... We need a new form of digital education, digital citizenship and digital empowerment so that actually it adds to people's skill set, but at the same time, it gives them the tools to protect and empower themselves. And I think that one of the, my favourite things in all of this is that um, Nominet have done a um, scout badge on digital um, citizenship. I think that's a really lovely thing to do. I think it's a really important thing to do, but it needs to apply in every sector of society for those people, because especially post the pandemic... There is no such thing as your online life and your offline life anymore. It's just life, right? Because how many of it, it's amazing this is in person and not in, over Zoom. So there is, especially in our colleges, but, you know, the, um, I want the fire back. But, um, yeah, um, so I just, you know, we've got to be slightly more imaginative. And that's why I think this, you know, we could be doing this in such a different way, but that does require legislators to think about things that are not just legislation. Although, given how cold it is, I'm sure many of us will be home in their pajamas watching this on YouTube. Right now. <laughs> um, great. We're going to open it up to the rest of the room. So while you're formulating these questions, I just wanted to ask, Maeve Tony, whether you thought Ruth's concerns about age gating in the context of our children discussion are apt. Are there risks, are there collateral risks to these age gating requirements, such as forcing dis dissidents to have to register? I, I think that's, that's really interesting. There are, uh, age verification is not required under, very, under parts of the bill, but it's strongly, uh, strongly indicated for uh, protecting children, particularly from the, the riskiest and, and most harmful content. We talk about this largely in the context of pornography because that is where, uh, that's actually, that's, all, that, that's where we already expect children to be, um, or users to have to prove some sort of uh, age offline there's no equivalent to that online whatsoever. We, we, we simply don't do that. So what, so what is the, if you think about, uh, forgive me for, for going into some depth on some of this stuff, but uh, if you were uh, trying to get into, if you're trying to get into a nightclub or you're trying to get into a, um, a sex cinema or something like that, you would be expected to, you would expect to have to provide your, uh, some, uh, some identity, not so that the identity itself was recorded mm -hmm. because it never is, but the, the proof um, of your age. What's the digital equivalent to that where you can prove your age without having to reveal your identity? to the person who's providing the service. Really interesting challenge. 
I, I don't think that I uh, agree with the argument that all services will need to understand the identity of all of their users. I, I think that's not, that wouldn't be a proportionate, for most services that, that simply wouldn't be a proportionate response and we certainly wouldn't be requiring that. Um, only for a very small number of services, I can't, actually can't think of any, where we would need to, users to be identified, some certainly for their age. There are ways that this can happen through various intermediaries and, 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 and third parties that can happen. But it's just, it, just to, to go back to the risk assessment for, the, um, for a second, um, that the split that we're talking about is largely for services to know whether a user is a child or an adult. That is pretty much all that they need to know. Uh, services, by and large, already know this through a process called age assurance because they serve ads to those uh, users. And by and large, children don't get served ads that it's illegal to show children, such as for tobacco and alcohol. So the bigger services are, already have a great deal of information about users um, and, and use that to target ads extremely effectively. Uh, so what, uh, so the, one of the questions that we will need to work out with uh, service providers over the next few years is what's the appropriate level of certainty that the services need to, need to have in order to protect them from certain types of content uh, and for, for um, I don't know going on uh, a video sharing uh, site like TikTok um, there might be uh, I, it's easy to envisage that there will be certain videos that are protected for or not, not shown to a user until the service has a greater understanding of that user's age. And that might be over the course of a few weeks or, or, or indeed just a few days of clicking, uh, understanding which videos they're interested in, which users they follow, um, what they type into a search bar. All of this can build up into a picture of an age of the, the user without knowing their identity. As I said, it's already, this, this exact same system is already used to, to target adverts. There's a different system, of course, for accessing uh, that most extreme uh, content, and we've already had some success in this space through our regulation of OnlyFans um, into the video sharing platform regime. They've already introduced uh, privacy preserving strong age verification for the first time to make sure that all users who are um, both users and creators actually are now over the age of 18, which is something they didn't do beforehand. Great, thanks, Tony. Great, we're going to open it up to the room. Uh, try to keep your questions short and snappy. Go for it. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for your insights. Um, but I'm just wondering, I know that obviously you discussed that the bill is kind of still being de debated and it still has to go through the House of Lords, but my question is to Tony. Like, um, given like these kind of um, platforms are mainly kind of, we're talking about big businesses really, like um, Snapchat and like Instagram and all of that. So, like, what is being discussed in terms of non-compliance? Like, how will there be kind of uh, like a specific framework for kind of um, violations? I mean, especially like, these businesses have had, like a history of of kind of just treating non-compliance like paying it off, like just as you know, paying it off with money. So, um, how is that going to be dealt with? And also, a second question: um, you talked about like how you would kind of, um, kind of give flexibility to these services in terms of how they're going to report what they're doing in terms of their compliance. Um, how flexible is that going to be? I mean, I feel like, especially now with like a very recent kind of article in the Financial Times talking about like less than, literally less than 20 companies were being able to report on their environmental uh, emissions. Correct. I mean, how would that look like in a content of like online safety and that? given even like environmental is like even much bigger problem. Great and questions. That, so yeah. Great questions. So let's try to keep short and snappy answers so we can get to as many people as possible. So what are the teeth and how flexible? Okay, good, uh, good uh, I mean, really good question. Uh, the question to, the, the response really is, we don't know yet, uh, so we're still working some of that through. Genuinely, we don't know because we're only halfway through the process of the, the bill uh, in its parliamentary stages. We're still working out uh, exactly how we will supervise and promote compliance in these companies. You're absolutely right. These companies, by and large, don't have a history of having been regulated whatsoever. So it's going to have, require a culture change in, inside these services. They're going to have to know what their requirements are, and they're going to have to, to figure, out, uh, figure out how to engage with the regulators, not just the regulator here in the UK. Um, the, the teeth that we have are, are pretty significant. So uh, 
just to be clear, we will not be will not be jumping to uh, to fines. We'll be trying to encourage compliance in in the first stages. We'll be uh, uh, helping them understand how to do risk assessments. We'll be helping them how to uh, to make changes rather than jumping on them and, and issuing them with fines. But if we need to, we will be able to issue fines of up to ten percent of their um, relevant turnover, which is a slightly complicated uh, thing to calculate. Those, I expect that those are, will be a very, very rare and only in the most egregious, uh, egregious examples. But it's worth saying that we're not just talking about the top three, five, 15, 20 uh, companies. We're talking about potentially 25,000 services just based in the UK who are gonna be in scope of the bill. Uh, and then many, many millions more based uh, around the world. In reality, we're not going to have contact with all of those services. So uh, we will be helping and supporting the larger services, perhaps those categorised ones I talked about before, perhaps the top 20 or 30. We'll be, we'll be devoting a lot of effort to helping them comply and then providing more generic advice to, uh, uh, to the smaller services and, and, and down what we sometimes unflatteringly call the long tail. Um, but you're right, we'll, we all need to be focused on the services that pose the highest risk of harm to UK users. So we'll be... We'll be setting up some of this out uh, in the new year, I think. In the early part of the year, I should say. Ruth, you wanted to interject quickly? Yeah, just very quickly. One of the problems with this is that two of the platforms that generate most of the hate online are Parler and BitChute. Um, they don't make a profit. So you're not going to be able to find them. And their T's and C's, I mean, they don't make a profit on purpose. They're political entities. And then the issue is that their hate speech that is put on those platforms is then um, used on some of the more mainstream platforms. They delete it, but they'll be the ones that will keep trying to delete it. And there's issues about, I mean, the, the data changes slightly on each one, so they can become really hard to delete. And that will be the problem, because Ofcom won't be able to regulate them, because the ultimate thing is a fine, and if they're a loss-making entity, what are you going to do? Okay. So that's a bit of a challenge. Great. Next question. Thank you for the discussion, it's really interesting. So basically two questions. So firstly, I, you just mentioned like, for example, uh, in today's social media age, like, um, like some like harmful content posted on, online, you know, just was deleted before, you know, the, the person saw it or was deleted when the person, you know, went back to find it, you know, try to prove it as evidence. I'm just wondering, because there's no like any, like action taken on it uh, currently. So I'm just wondering, for example, if one day, for example, uh, this kind of harmful, harmful um, content could be restored easily, then what if it applies to, you know, each post on social media applies to everything on social media. Then for example, if one day I post some personal experiences, but like later I regret to post it, but it could be restored easily after that. So I'm just wondering how, I, I believe that would be like intruding into my privacy. So how, how, how would you balance, you know, the, the interest, you know, my privacy interest also, you know, probably I have a harm, I have harmed someone, but also like, no, I mean, yeah, how would you balance interests? That's my first question. And the Great, I think we'll have to keep it for one question a person. Does anyone want to take that? Yeah, so it's really um, Tech Against Terrorism has developed something called the Digital Evidence Locker, and um, it would be everything that illegal would have been or um, harmful content um, under the previous um, iteration of the bill could be transferred into there by the platforms, and then... I would argue, to protect your privacy, um, it would be um, the police and security services, um, academics, because we're, one of the things that we might miss here is patterns of language, and language evolves, and uh, dog whistle uh, racism also evolves, like language evolves. So um, academics um, and Ofcom would all have access to it, and then, they, um, and then prosecutions could still happen, but it would be removed. Like, if you're, that's what you're gonna do, that's what I'd want. It's really straightforward and someone else has done the tech, but it needs a legislative framework to do it because currently that, that doesn't exist anywhere in the world. Great. Next question. Yes, gentlemen down here. Yeah, um, Wait for the mic so the video picks you up. Okay. Um, thank you very much indeed. Um, the name's Ewan Grant. I'm former law enforcement intelligence analyst, customs and excise. And uh, I do recall... Um, the lady's comment about the need to improve analytical skills among the public and so many other organizations, because 20 years ago when I taught the John F. Kennedy case as a training tool, uh, I was getting increasingly worried about how very many students were expecting 
the, the computer program, or we now call them the algorithms, to do the thinking for them. It was very, and that's over 20 years ago. My question is, how much, this is really for the big companies and then filtering down, how much confidence do you have that the operational management staff and the technical staff are working together to create accurate risk assessments and responsive risk assessment. Because in my experience, not to put too blunt a point, many techies are somewhat autistic and they're not really aware of what harm can be done in the real world. Look at the crypto fraud explosion in the last week. Thanks a lot. Yeah, go for it. I'll, yeah, um, I think, I suppose, that, again, this is the point of regulation, isn't it? So it, it, it's putting the onus on, um, on that company to ensure that uh, whoever's developing the tech is um, uh, considering the um, particular harms, the particular outcomes, the particular application of that tech, um, and also then ensuring that whoever's designing the platform more generally is looking at how that, that is then kind of contributing to the um, end experience of the user and indeed how individual or groups of users might then use that platform and that, those services. Um, I, I think you're right. I think obviously it's the whole you know move fast and break things mentality, isn't it, that is coming to an end now because I mean there have been enough examples Examples of where things have been pretty badly broken, to be honest, and you only have to look at the um, uh, the evidence that Francis Haugen um, uh, brought out of Meta last year uh, in terms of understanding how much the platforms do know about the types of harms that their services are, are creating and how much the design. I mean, the particular example there was with Instagram and and, uh, and body image and, and eating disorders and, and the kind of mental health of, of young girls who are, are on that platform. They knew exactly how that was impacting. They knew. Exactly Exactly how again the design, the, 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 the functionality, and the service was creating that harm, but they didn't do anything about it. So I think this is what what this is doing, is at least allowing um, a regulatory body to shine a bit of a light on that and to ask questions as to why they weren't acting on that evidence, and then to ensure that then that kind of loop in the organisation that you're that, that kind of disconnect, if you like, between tech people and the people who may be kind of, uh, I think that we always see the, de the the disconnect, I think, between the government relations people who are very good at, at spinning a line uh, and yeah. the uh, yeah. and the tech people, and you know we. we We've facilitated quite a few meetings actually where we've asked for tech people to come along to talk to us and we still get the government relations people. So, you know, this at least is, 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 is closing that gap, I think, um, uh, in the future. So. Great. Anyone else on that point? Good. So we're about at time, but I just wanted to, to ask one final question, which has to do with the systemic character of the legislation. And there is a wary, I think, that the legislation reinforces, reinforces the idea that all we need to do is get the leave up, take down content moderation right and the online public sphere will become better. But there's a broader set of questions about how these platforms should be curating the conversation generally. And the thought is that even if you got the content moderation policies exactly right, there's still something dysfunctional about, about the way we talk to each other online. And I wondered if you had any closing thoughts about what we can do about that broader challenge of improving democratic discourse. A lofty final question. Um, that's really easy. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> Look, I think that a lot of this is about culture and that one of the issues all the way through has been um, technology has changed in my lifetime. You know, my phone now has everything on my life. I live and breathe my world through my phone and through social media and my news is generated via Twitter that takes me on to news stories. I don't buy a date. Well, I, I still do occasionally buy a daily newspaper, but I have the digital version of it. So, like, the life has... The world has changed... And we haven't had a national conversation about what that should look like in terms of our public discourse. We've sort of sat there as, this is, as if this is happening to us rather than deciding what we want it to look like. And one of the things that we haven't really touched on, and I underdialed about how much trouble I could get myself into this evening, but actually a, regular, a, regular, a regulatory framework that we are proposing is in the best interest of the big companies so what we're really doing, because they'll be the ones that can afford to put in all the systems to comply, which means we're stuck where we are. 
really, in terms of, you know, we can tweak, we can play, but culturally, how much is really going to change unless we have a conversation about what type of world we want to live on online, unless we have a conversation about tolerate each other's views versus respect each other's views, unless we have a conversation about what language is appropriate and isn't appropriate, and unless we can do what would happen if you walk down the street or in the swimming pool analogy you used... One of the things, you know, I do a lot of anti-racism training, and one of the things I will say, you know, know, how can, you know, when people say, well, how can I help? The victim isn't the one that's meant to stand up and shout back. It's meant to be you on their behalf. Every time. If you see someone walking down the street and it's a woman being shouted at, or you're on the tube and it's a woman being shouted at, or it's an older person who's being abused, or it's a race incident, it's not for them. It's not, and people shouldn't hide away from it. It's for everyone else to say, what on earth are you doing? And this is unacceptable in the society we live in. We have not got to that position online yet. And I think that that's the, the cultural conversation about how we want to live. You know, one of the reasons I'm such a f- supporter of free expression is because that allows us to have a conversation about the next stage in human development, the next part of what happens next. And we need that cultural conversation in order, because I think that's where all three of us, I would hope, would agree. It's none of us want, I mean, you should look at my social media mentions from the last month. No one wants to live like that. So why wouldn't we do, you know, how do we fix the cultural bit? And that's my concern, the legislation. It's easy for politicians to make the companies change. It's almost impossible for them to make people change. It's so much harder. And therefore, and, it, and this, is, this is so on, a, on the general election material, politicians will be able to say, I voted to fix this. This isn't going to fix how we talk to each other online. Um, I, I, I'd agree. I'd agree with the lack, actually, despite the fact the bill has been developed for so long, there hasn't been a, a conversation about a lot of this sort of stuff. But I think to go back to your question, the, I think the way that the government has developed the legislation now, um, it has both in the bill and in the kind of narrative around it, forced that focus on individual bits of content and takedown as being the answer. So, you know, obviously the, by, again, the, the very the, the focus on illegal content being necessary, but we've lost a lot of the other stuff that actually, you know, you still would need to be kind of defining the types of um, uh, activity that you would not want to see online. And that in itself is, is, is not really the kind of the, the cooperative, you know, collaborative process, but it would have gone some way to at least saying there are some types of things that we don't accept. And to come back to your point about um, uh, uh, individual victims and so forth, particularly in the case of, of, of women and girls, obviously a lot of the abuse that uh, individuals and, and um, groups, uh, you know, particularly uh, from kind of minority groups experience online, is designed to hound them off platforms, you know, so this is the, the, the free speech of others uh, is effectively kind of taking away the free speech of those um, individuals if they feel that they can't stay on those platforms anymore. So I don't think we've really even begun to start talking about about that at all and I think the political direction now has taken away from that by basically saying it's everybody's right to say what they want and actually if you're on the receiving end of it there isn't really any recourse anymore so I think that's a step there's there's a systemic nature there's a systemic underpinning to the bill but I think you're right in terms of how that translates into the type of society you want to see there's a disconnect now great Tony final thought just 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 to say that most of these uh, questions are definitely are with the realm of regulation (laughs) um, which is not a get out but but only to say that uh, there are going to be changes coming to the platforms and some of them will flow from regulation, some of them will come from the transparency that comes along with that. So as users uh, and regulators uh, um, uh, understand a bit more, and hopefully civil society groups as well, understand a bit more about how these platforms operate, um, how they target uh, uh, content and the measures and the effectiveness that they've already put in place to protect users, there will come some change there. Whether that will be quick enough, uh, I don't know, but it changes coming not just here in the UK, but in, in several other jurisdictions as well. So I think you're absolutely right, Ruth. The internet that we have in five years' time will be very different from the internet that we have now. The trick is to try and make sure that we don't ossify, we don't end up um, uh, only entrenching uh, the largest platforms. I think I'm okay with there being uh, a higher bar to entry than there currently is, when the bar to entry is so low that it allows services that uh, services to uh, new services to essentially be forums for massive, enormous spread of child sexual abuse material or allow terrorists to plot online. How do we make sure that those services don't uh, start and don't allow their, their content to proliferate while allowing the freedom of expression that we uh, that we expect and, and every user wants? 
Great. So we'll wish Ruth good luck for when the bill comes to the Lords next year. <laughs> we'll wish Tony good luck with the massive new job he has. We will all be watching. Let's thank our speakers for a really engaging discussion. Fantastic. So that's all we have. Um, I want to remind you about our first policy and practice event next term, which will be a discussion of a new book by Paul Tucker from the Harvard Kennedy School, Global Discord, Values and Power in a Fractured World. That's on the 19th of January. You can sign up on online. If you don't already, follow us on Twitter or Instagram. Our handle is UCLSPP. That's the School of Public Policy. We announce all the events there, and you'll be able to keep up to date. Thank for joining us all, and let's thank our speakers one more time. Yeah. <laughs>